Dark energy is indicated in the standard model by the observation of type 1a supernovae that appear to be too far away given the present measure of the expanding universe. Astronomers have determined that these types of novae release a predictable amount of energy that is measurably constant. Therefore, by analyzing the amount of light received here, they can estimate with some confidence the distance to a particular nova of this type, just as you could estimate the distance to lighted candles by their luminosity if all of them were of the same type, but placed at varying distances. Having this distance measure in hand, there is another distance measurement to be made based on the red shift of the galaxy containing that nova. By the theory of the uniformly expanding universe, the recessional velocity of observed galaxies is directly proportional to their distance. Thus, doubling the distance doubles the recessional velocity. The measure of this expansion is the Hubble constant, given in kilometers per second per megaparsec. It's about 70. A parsec is 3.26 light years, and a megaparsec is a million times that. We can then divide the Hubble constant into the speed of light, and we get 4,285 megaparsecs. This is the Hubble radius, which is the distance at which we can no longer see anything in principle because the objects would be receding from us at the speed of light and would be redshifted beyond possible detection. Now from the redshift of the type 1a supernova we're observing, we can derive a distance estimate that, if the expansion of the universe were constant, would be the same as the other distance estimate obtained by measuring the apparent brightness of that nova, calculated from the known constant for all type 1a supernovae. These two distance measurements are found to be in disagreement. The apparent brightness of a given nova is too dim for its redshift distance. It's too far away. The interpretation is that the Hubble constant was less in the past than now and that we are seeing starlight emitted when the Hubble constant was less. Understand here that a lesser Hubble constant yields a much larger universe when we divide it into the speed of light. The extended interpretation is that if the expansion continued to accelerate, the visible universe would become gradually depopulated of galaxies until at length only our own galaxy would be visible. The Hubble radius could be at the edge of our own Milky Way galaxy. The other major astronomical problem is dark matter, which is ostensibly the extra mass that accounts for the galactic clusters that hold their members more tightly than would be allowed by their measured velocities within that cluster, and for the flat velocity curves of stars in rotating galaxies. I wish to show that these two phenomena are directly related to one another if one simply changes one's perspective. In the pre-Copernican Ptolemaic system, astronomers were saddled with an array of epicycles to explain the apparent movements of the planets in an Earth-centered system. When Copernicus changed the perspective to a Sun-centered system, all those epicycles disappeared in favor of simplified circles and ellipses, and from this simplification, Newton was able to deduce that one force would explain them all. In regard to the dark energy problem, we must change our perspective from expanding space to shrinking atoms, meaning that the Compton wavelengths of particles are becoming smaller, rather than that space is growing larger. Doing this allows us to get rid of a lot of unnecessary baggage. Instead of space expanding into a fourth dimension, it remains at all times in the familiar three. All matter needn't be compressed into an infinitely small singularity. It can be initially uniformly distributed throughout space. To spread particles uniformly in a Euclidean reference frame, 
requires some sort of field to act as the gauge for that distribution. If we designate a cube and ask how many particles should be placed within it, we would be compelled to say it must be the average number between zero and infinity, but by mathematical induction no such average number exists. It could be any number n. Therefore, we allow that there will be one particle per unit cube throughout the entire plenum. Now, if we superimpose another gauge field over this array with different size unit cubes, we can say that a different finite number of particles is placed in each differently sized unit cube, and the same could be said of any size unit cube. Thus, the answer to how many are placed per unit cube is given as n. Now we have that each particle's identity is that of the center of a spherical field, which is the identity of the gravitational field. This is an easy guess, because stars and planets are all round due to gravity, so it's not much of a stretch to say that the gravitational field is probably spherical as opposed to cubic or tetrahedral or anything else. Now for the gauge field to exist relative to these spherical particle fields requires that some artifact of engagement be observable. Thus, if one interacts with the other, there must be some embodiment of that interaction. Since the gauge field is Euclidean and the particle field spherical, we can surmise that the straight gauge field gets somewhat curved and the round field gets flattened out to some degree. Then the gauge field initially must be invested with unit tension, whereas in the completely flat, unmolested state, it would have no tension whatsoever. This is comparable to a rubber band. Lying flat on a table has no tension and transmits no vibration through itself. To vibrate, and thus transmit energy along its field lines, it must first be stretched. It must be invested with an energy potential. And the tighter it is stretched, the faster energy can be transmitted through it, just as is the case with numerous materials with which we are familiar. It can now be seen that as the particles clump up due to gravity, the now empty space between clumps will be home to an unstretched gauge field if we say that the influence of the spherical field on the gauge field is reduced by increased distance. And if the unit tension originally possessed by that gauge field is reduced, it will not transmit energy as fast. Let the gauge field be the identity of the electromagnetic field. We can then surmise that the speed of light is slowed as a function of the gravitational clumping. But if light speed slows as the universe develops, we have the mathematically identical condition that astronomers ascribe to an increasing Hubble expansion rate. For it makes no mathematical difference, and thus no observable difference, if we increase the Hubble constant in an expanding universe, or decrease the speed of light in a universe of shrinking Compton wavelengths. Because the tension of the gauge field is being reduced by repositioning particles into clumps, we can view this as a force analogous to surface tension added to gravity in the same direction. Such a force will cause the flattening of the rotation curves of stars in rotating galaxies by way of angular momentum conservation, and will give extra speed to galaxies within clusters by way of adiabatic compression. This, then, is what dark matter is, not exotic particles, but rather an inherent changeable condition of the gauge field. So by accepting the shrinking of Compton wavelengths in lieu of expanding space, we lose the necessity of explaining how all of matter can be put into a potentially infinitely small space, how space might expand into a fourth dimension. Dark matter need no longer be sought because it does not exist. Dark energy is explained as a measurement choice that simply represents the solution to the former dark matter problem.
The fundamental nature of gravity, inertia, and the nuclear force can also be easily derived from the initial condition of one particle per unit cube. If we assert that in the initial state, every center of a spherical field possesses unit determinacy by being in the unit cube, and also unit indeterminacy by being anywhere in the cube. I have treated these subjects in other videos, so won't delve into them here, but they are equally as simple. In the model I propose, we still observe an apparent expansion of the universe when we think of ourselves as being constant in size. But which is true, expanding space or shrinking particles? Reduced complexity favors shrinking particles, just as the Copernican sun-centered system simplifies the solar system over the Ptolemaic earth-centered system. I think I have done here as much as Copernicus. However, nothing is to be acknowledged, because this is a decaying civilization, as opposed to the burgeoning civilization of Copernicus. His case was tough, but mine is impossible. Today's scientists are, in truth, government employees. They are similar to bureaucrats, whose goal in life is to complexify positions by creating truckloads of rules and regulations, thereby requiring ever more bureaucrats to do the great work of regulating non-production.